thrilled to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Carrie Howe for this prestigious award. Carrie, as I will refer to him, is the director of the Center for Water and the Environment that has well over $3 million in expenditures each year. In his 18 years at UNM, he served as principal investigator on over $14 million in research funding, authored two major textbooks, has a patent, and makes hundreds of contributions to conferences and journals. Yet Carrie is one of the most unassuming, humble guys that I know. He may have a bit of a Clark Kent Superman thing going on. He appears he appears to be an ordinary engineer with his frayed khakis and button down shirt, but when he's not in the classroom, he's out saving the world. Even as we learn about water on other planets, the fact remains that managing and cleaning our water is vital to our very existence on this planet. And just like in superhero movies, the enemy becomes more sophisticated. Carrie's work has considered unique water and treatment issues for decades and includes strategies for dealing with emerging contaminants such as those from pharmaceuticals. Carrie grew up in Wisconsin and received his undergraduate degree at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He then went to the University of Texas at Austin where he earned a master's in environmental health engineering under the direction of Des Lawler, whom some 30 plus years later, Carrie still publishes with. But also quite notable, the University of Texas is where Carrie met his now wife, Elaine, also a graduate student in engineering. After earning his master's, Carrie worked as a consulting engineer with Montgomery Watson Harza for 12 years, designing, evaluating, and planning water and wastewater treatment engineering projects. That practical experience is something Carrie brings to the classroom. He is able to help students translate theory to application and design. After a successful career in the consulting world and the addition of three children to Kenny Lane's family, Carrie went to another premier state institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he earned his PhD in environmental engineering. With PhD in hand, he moved his family to Albuquerque and started as an assistant professor here at UNM. Over those 18 years, he moved up through the ranks. Meanwhile, those three little kids grew up and now Jim, Holly, and Catherine are now out saving the world as engineers and health professionals. So I'm changing my superhero analogy to The Incredibles. It is during that time at UNM that I've known Carrie to be an outstanding faculty member, balancing an intense research career while staying relevant in the classroom and mentoring students in countless ways. Our offices were next door to each other for a number of years in Centennial Engineering Center, the building that we should all be sitting in right now. And once again, in Carrie's unassuming way, he is giving his annual research lecture over Zoom rather than with the typical fanfare of a campus event. But back in Centennial Engineering, Carrie and I had offices down a hallway where there is a sign with an arrow stating civil faculty. That sign has always amused me, sort of implying that the other faculty might be contentious. That is the context in which I know Carrie. He is a great colleague, civil in every way, thoughtful, hardworking, and considerate of others, all while maintaining superhero status and keeping the water on our planet safe to use and drink. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Dr. Carrie Howe, as UNM's recipient of the 65th Annual Research Lecturer Award. Wow, thank you, Julie. I, I, I think we're done. I mean, I, I don't know how I can give a presentation after that introduction. But, uh, um, that's that's uh, very, very nice. So I'm going to share my screen here, if I can do this correctly. So someone tell me if you're now seeing a title slide, providing safe drinking water. All okay. clear. Great, thank you. Okay, well, I want to thank Julie for that introduction. I want to thank the Vice President for Research Office for hosting this event every year and the Provost for kicking it off. Edel for nominating me and really everyone at UNM for um, 
uh, bestowing this honor on me. When um, UNM announced this award publicly a few weeks ago, I happened to be on a conference call with Barbara McCready, who uh, won this award two years ago. And she congratulated me and then suggested that uh, one thing to do to, to, to do the presentation properly was to show some slides of baby animals because everyone likes baby animals and that seemed like a good idea and then later that day I I got um, an email from the person who won it last year and he also suggested some slides of baby animals so I am going to start with um, a baby animal and this this presentation is about our drinking water and obviously animals can just go to any stream or lake and drink directly out of the water. But if we were to do that, we would get sick. And so we need to have a different strategy, a different approach to how we approach our drinking water. And of course, I've made this presentation about recycling wastewater. So this is the other appropriate animal picture that we'll go with. Julie mentioned the Center for Water and the Environment. I want to take just a couple minutes to talk a little bit more about this center before I started my actual presentation. The Center for Water and the Environment, we started uh, six or seven years ago now, and it's got a, a number of major themes within the center. We focus on doing research related to watersheds and the idea that our water supply comes from mountainous areas and those mountainous areas are under a variety of threats from drought and climate change and forest fires. And so there's a major research effort within our center on how those, those factors are changing our water supply. And more importantly, what we as engineers can do to uh, preserve the water supply as the environment is changing. A second major theme is treatment technologies, and that consists of biologically based treatment technologies and membrane treatment technologies. And then a third area that we're doing research on is the interaction between water and energy. And these students up here in the upper right are doing um, experiments with um, plants to see if they will uptake uh, specific heavy metals that are in a water supply in an area occupied by Native Americans that um, the water supply was contaminated by previous mining activities. But in addition to this re these research areas, we also um, have a significant effort in outreach. And so one of the major goals of the center is to increase the number of students that are going into STEM professions, that's science, techno technology, engineering, and mathematics. And so we, um, this trailer that I'm showing here, we have a number of activities that we take out to high schools and middle schools and community events. And we um, try to in, uh, in explain water issues to uh, students and community members and then talk to them about science and engineering and why that's a good career path. And a particular focus of the center is on trying to, to promote diversity and trying to encourage underrepresented minorities to go into STEM professions. And so I just added a graph down on the lower left that shows the number of Hispanic, Native American, and females that have been in our center over the last six years through one specific grant. And this is the CREST grant, uh, which stands for Centers for Research Excellence in Science and Technology um, from the National Science Foundation. And through this grant, we've had some, some real success in encouraging uh, Hispanic and Native Americans to go into engineering at rates um, significantly higher than what the School of Engineering as a whole has been able to do. And, and the same with uh, female of all races, where um, the, we funded about 50 graduate students through this grant over the last six years, and 59% and of them have been female. Now, obviously with COVID, we've had to change our outreach activities. We can't go to high schools and middle schools anymore. So one of the things we've done recently that I'm showing on the screen now is we partnered with a, a science museum here in Albuquerque called Explora. And we put together a program where um, we are helping 
middle school and high school teachers who are, they're also in the process of scrambling to do online education. So we have a program where the students in their classrooms get mailed a box of stuff that's related to water. And then we have a week's worth of activities that they do that they learn about science and engineering while, um, while doing activities related to water. And the, uh, the people I'm showing here, whoops, our, is our outreach coordinator and our lab manager, two undergraduate students and a postdoc who's been working with me. I also real briefly want to mention the Sustainable Water Resources Grant Challenge. The upper administration at UNM have established a number of grant challenges at UNM, uh, three of them, sustainable water resources, successful aging, and, and addiction. And um, this one, water resources, our goal here is to bring people, a, a larger number of people together to work on water related issues. There are people, there are faculty and students all over UNM working on water issues, not only in engineering, but in biology, in earth and planetary sciences, um, geography, the law school, and all of these people are, are coming together now, collaborating, pursuing larger grants so that we can have a greater impact on solving water related issues in New Mexico, the Southwest and around the world. Hi, so, Carrie, it's Pamela. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, we seem to be having some sort of a um, echo and I don't know if it's on your end, um, but we can hear it on our end. I'm not hearing any echo. We should make sure everyone mutes who is not Carrie Howe. Is that better? We can, no. yeah, I can still hear it. It's, um, I'm is not there, sure. Is there a way for the host to mute everybody and then unmute me? Uh, let's see. Uh, bear with me one moment here. Let me just yeah. look, make sure. You're the only one that's muted now, other than Pamela. Um, that's unmuted, other than Pamela. Speaking. Yeah. Do you, do you hear it, Grace? Okay, guys. Let me help you as an electrical engineer. So, Kerry, can you move your computer a little bit or your position slightly? It may help. It may have to do with your mic. Okay. Is that better? We can still hear it. We may have to live with it. So. Well, I don't hear it on my end. How bad is it? It's not that bad. It's a minor base. Sounds like running water. <laughs> okay. So I wonder. You know what it might be? My, my computer fan is running um, at high speed. It seems to kick in when you speak, Kerry. When you're silent, there's no noise. Honestly, I'm not joking. You know what I can do? I am gonna switch and put some headphones on. If you don't mind us- That will help. Yeah. It's yeah. maybe the, the other end, so I don't hear the echo. It's perfectly fine to me. Okay, hang on one second. Bear with us one moment, everyone. Now I would need to change my Is that better? Better. Yes. Okay. Just turn up your volume a little bit, I think. I don't think I have control over my volume, but you can turn up. There. 
Okay, Grace, it seems like the, the echo has gone away. Uh, now the, it sounds like the volume is just a little bit low. Can you hear okay? Uh, he's not speaking. Okay. Harry. Um, yeah, how is, how is that right now? Is that better, Grace? Yeah, it sounds, it's a little bit low, but it sounds better. At least the echo is not there. Um, Carrie, check the compute, the volume on the computer. I've, I've got mine up, turned up. I, I think this is good enough. Yeah, this is fine, I think. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Helm. Well, let's continue then. Yes. So my plan for today is to give some basics on water treatment. And then I want to pose the question, why would we want to recycle our wastewater and what would we need to do to make it safe to drink? And then I'm going to um, talk just a little bit about two representative research projects that, that I've had over these many years. So first, a little bit about water treatment. I'm gonna start with a little bit of history. So the initial connection between water and disease was identified. It was established back in 1854. There was a, um, a doctor in London, uh, Dr. John Snow, um, who established this connection. And so back in the day, um, even though there were, there were cities, larger cities around the world, there wasn't very good sanitation and people would just basically dump their human waste out into the street. It would run into the gutters and then run into the rivers. And cities were plagued by uh, outbreaks of cholera and typhoid on, on a pretty regular basis. And these, these outbreaks would just you know, run through the city and devastate things. And, and Dr. Snow, at one point, there was an outbreak of cholera occurring in London, and he started um, identifying where every case of it was occurring and came to realize that everyone who had cholera had gotten water from the same well. And so he became convinced that that well was actually the source of the cholera. And he went to the city leaders and, and told them what he had found and asked them to, to, to lock the handle on the well. This was a public well out in the street. And so water couldn't, so people couldn't get water from it. And the, uh, and the epidemic ended, the, the cholera epidemic ended as soon as they um, um, locked access to that well. And so it became really clear that water was a way of transmitting disease. Now, during this time, various communities had some treatment. They had, there were, were communities, some, not very many, that had filtration systems, what was, what was called slow, fan, slow sand filtration. And these systems were typically put in place more for aesthetics than anything else. So if they were taking water from a fairly turbid river or fairly polluted river, and they wanted to make it taste or smell a little better, they would add uh, this, this slow sand filtration system. Well, then um, a, a couple of decades later, there was two cities in Germany, one immediately downstream of another one, where one of the cities had a filtration system and the other one didn't. And again, there was a cholera outbreak and the city that did not have filtration was just devastated by cholera. The city that had filtration um, no one got sick. And so it became evident that um, filtration not only improved the aesthetics of the water, but could actually take out whatever it was that was in the water that was causing disease. And at this point, um, they were just, just now starting to understand the germ theory of disease and how, how bacteria uh, causes disease. So um, a couple of decades later, the first continuous chlorination system in uh, water supply in the United States. This was in uh, Jersey City in 1908. And so we now had a system where filtration and chlorination were two key aspects of water filtration. And over that whole time, the, the focus really of water treatment was on pathogens. These are the microorganisms that cause disease. And so for the first, say, 
hundred years of history of water treatment. The focus was entirely on controlling pathogens. And this was very effective in um, eliminating outbreaks of cholera and typhoid to the extent that the Centers for Disease Control call water chlorination and treatment one of the 10 greatest public health achievements of the 20th century. Well, so after that, say starting in the 30s or 40s, we started seeing a, a change in our society uh, with the advent of chemicals. And um, chemical companies were creating all kinds of wonderful new products, fertilizers that would let us grow more crops, pesticides that would protect our food against bugs and pests, and waterproof fabrics and plastics for all kinds of home products. Teflon for nonstick pans, fire retardants, mosquito repellents, antibiotics, all kinds of pharmaceuticals. And so all of these things were being introduced in our society, which was in really increasing um, the, the standard of living, the comfort that people had. Um, and chemistry was really considered this, this, this wonderful new thing that was making our lives better. But, but in those early days, in the 40s and the 50s, we weren't very good. We didn't really have a plan for controlling the discharge of chemicals into the environment. And so um, at the same time we were getting all these wonderful new products, we were also inadvertently polluting our water supplies. And then another big event um, in, um, 1974, there was a discovery that this chlorination that we had been doing for the last 70 years actually caused harmful byproducts in water. That when chlorine was added to water that contained natural organic matter, a chemical reaction happened that actually created chemicals in the water that could, could even cause cancer. And so now we had this, this idea that we've been chlorinating water for, for 70 years, and there's actually um, not only does that take care of cholera and typhoid, but it actually causes some, some harm in the water. And so now we have all kinds of uh, water pollution from chemicals. So we've got um, algal blooms that occur because of excess, excess nutrients, excess fertilizers that run into water supply. This picture down here is um, the Animas River in southern southwestern Colorado after a mine spill, and of course, all kinds of pollution here. And so this water pollution really is everywhere on the planet. There's no, and even, and even in places, so this is an article on soils and sediments in high altitude mountain lakes in Europe, and they find polychlorinated biphenols and hexachlorobenzene and other, and DDT and other chemicals are found even in places that you would think are very pristine. So we now are in a situation where um, our water supplies have really around the globe have been uh, contaminated with chemicals. And so we still have this focus, this emphasis on pathogens as part of water supply, but overlaying on top of that over the last, say, 50 years, we now have an additional emphasis on removing chemicals. So we need to remove pathogens. We also need to remove chemicals. Pathogens cause an immediate or an acute effect. And so if I drink water with E. coli in it today, I'm going to have, I'm going to be vomiting and have diarrhea tonight. Um, you know, so it's, we need constant protection. Um, the slightest um, failure of a treatment system could cause a problem with pathogens. We reduce chemicals to very low levels and we actually target to bring them down not only any kind of acute effect, but also to have them at concentrations below that which will cause any long-term or chronic effect, which, you know, if you were to drink that water for 70 years, there'd be a possible lifetime cancer rate. We keep the concentrations of chemicals below that level. And so we need different strategies for water treatment if we're doing chemicals. And, and a brief exceedance of a maximum contaminant level for a chemical may not have the same negative effect as a brief exceedance for pathogens. And of course, we also need to continue to con uh, consider the aesthetics of the water. So this 
shows some of the things that we want to worry about when we're doing water treatment. So the microorganisms that can cause us to get sick, bacteria and viruses, Cryptosporidium and Giardia are, are protozoa that can cause very severe gastrointestinal illness. So we need to remove those. We've got some naturally occurring inorganic matter. So iron and manganese and arsenic, these can actually be naturally, naturally occurring inorganic chemicals that we would want to remove from water. Um, natural organic matter, so algae and dead leaves and the degradation products of those things. Um, there's also um, human um, caused inorganics like nitrate from fertilizers and human caused organics like synthetic organics, pesticides, fertilizers, pharmaceuticals, solvents, and things like that. Then we've got chemicals or materials that we actually add during the water treatment process or chemicals that are formed during the treatment process, so disinfection byproducts. Um, the lead that we had in Flint, Michigan a few years ago was due to contact of the water with plumbing materials in the distribution system. The water did not have any lead in it when it left the, the water treatment plant. It picked up the lead in the plumbing in people's houses. And so we have to worry about what materials are in contact with the water. And that's the materials in the water treatment plants, the materials out in the distribution system. Even if you were buying bottled water, what's that bottle made of? Is that bottle made of a plastic that could leach into that water? And is that plastic something that would be bad for you? We also have physical parameters like pH and turbidity and hardness that we worry about. So one of the main things I want to say about this slide is there's all these different things that we need to worry about in water treatment. And all of these have different properties. And so the, the technologies that we would use to remove bacteria are different than the technologies we would use to remove pesticides or solvents or algae or, or, or different things like that. And so what we need to do as a water treatment engineer is figure out what are the properties of each one of these things that are in our water and how do we exploit the differences between the properties of that particular contaminant and the properties of water and design a treatment process that will, um, will exploit those properties so we can send the contaminants one way and the water molecules the other way. And so for instance, with something like bacteria, the property we might uh, exploit is size. If it's bigger than a water molecule, maybe we can filter it out. Um, there's other things on this list that uh, we can't filter out because they're the same size as water molecules. So this is a general um, schematic of how we might think about uh, water treatment. So on the left here, I've got a, a mixture of all kinds of things that might be in water. And the blue dots are water molecules. Then I've got bugs and natural organics and synthetic organics, sediments, inorganics. And these are all in the water together. And I'm going to pass that water through some kind of barrier. And maybe I add a chemical or something else, maybe it's powdered activated carbon, I add something to the water, and that barrier is going to remove some things. And so in this case, I've got a barrier that's removing bacteria and sediments and some of the natural organic matter. So now I've got some of those things out of the water, and maybe I need to go through another barrier that's going to remove another one of the constituents in the water. And then maybe another barrier that's going to remove additional things. And then if I added something like powdered activated carbon, maybe that would come out in, a, in another barrier along with the synthetic organics and, and some more of the natural organics. So we use this multi-barrier approach with multiple treatment technologies in water treatment. And some of the things I want to point out is that sometimes uh, we need more than one barrier to get a certain contaminant out. So I've got some natural organic matter coming out through the first barrier and some more coming out with the third. So sometimes uh, we've got technologies that remove multiple things. Sometimes we have technologies that are focused on one thing. Sometimes we need more than one technology to, to completely remove something. And sometimes we even have things that remain in the water. So I'm showing a couple of inorganics in the water here. Uh, it's more than just water molecules. 
but maybe that's calcium or something that's good for us. So we don't need to worry about removing it. So we don't remove, we don't end up removing everything to the lowest possible concentration or to, to below detection limits in water treatment. We re remove things until it's at safe concentrations. So here's just a number of different treatment technologies that we might use in water treatment. And we wouldn't be using all of these in any given plant, but we, we pick and choose among the available technologies based on the specific water contaminants that we have in any given supply. So sedimentation will help remove sediments and things that are, uh, we can exploit size and density. And if we have, uh, say, dirt particles, they'll settle to the bottom of this. Rapid granular filtration, we can add a chemical that makes dirt stick to the uh, filter media. Uh, disinfection, I talked about a little bit already. So we can, we can kill microorganisms by adding a disinfectant like chlorine. Reverse osmosis is a technology that's focused on removing dissolved matter. So with this technology, I can remove or separate um, species, constituents in the water that are the same size as water molecules, but have different properties. So maybe they're charged or maybe they are uh, got some other property that I can exploit and send the water through a membrane so that the water molecules go through and, and the dissolved species do not. Membrane filtration, another type of uh, filtration uh, for removing particles. Carbon adsorption, um, this is something where hydrophobic compounds will stick to the carbon and re be removed from the water. Advanced oxidation, we, we do a, a, a chemical oxidation. So lots of different technologies available to us. Now I'm going to switch a little bit. So I do want to talk about wastewater and, and whether that's a, a viable water supply for us. So here's a, a basic schematic of the urban water cycle. We take water out of the environment. Uh, say this is a river, maybe here in Albuquerque, this is the Rio Grande, and we put it through a water treatment plant. We make that water safe to drink. We distribute it to the community. The community uses the water, comes out of the faucet, you use it. Uh, it goes down the drain, goes into the sewer system, and then it goes to a water reclamation plant. We treat it again, and now we're not treating it because it got dirty while it was in the community. We're not treating it to make it into drinking water quality anymore. We're, we're treating it to make it safe to put back into the environment. And that's a different, different level of treatment that we're aiming for there. And then what happens in the community here? So in the community, we are sending water um, to commercial businesses and maybe, so here we're, what's going down the drain is food waste from a restaurant, maybe it's hair products from a salon, um, maybe it's mercury from a dentist. Different commercial um, facilities will uh, potentially have pretreatment requirements where they have to treat their waste before they're allowed to put in the sewer. Then we've got industry, and so there could be um, metals from electroplating. We could have solvents and cleaners and all kinds of different chemicals from manufacturing. That all goes into the sewer. And then here in our house, you know, how do we use our water? Well, we've got dishwashers, washing machines, toilets, sinks, uh, showering. All of those things uh, have processes by which they make the water dirty. The, the dirty water goes down the sewer. All that water is collected in the sewer system, goes to the reclamation plant, and back to the river. So we have this cycle. We take water out of the environment, we put it back into the environment, we clean it up before we put it back into the environment. And these wastewater plants are very effective at making the water safe to put back into the environment. The goals there is we don't want to harm the fish, we don't want to harm aquatic life, we want to make the water safe to swim in. Wastewater reclamation reclamation plants do that very well, but they're not necessarily designed to make the water of drinking quality. Now, um, I, I want to point out that almost everyone lives downstream of someone else. So if we take water out of a river and then downstream put it back into the river, well, there's someone downstream of us who's taking water out of that river uh, and is using it for their drinking water supply. And 
they are now drinking a portion of our wastewater. And so if I live here in St. Louis, uh, I am getting the wastewater, treated wastewater, of course, uh, it's been treated to very high quality, uh, from Minneapolis and from Chicago and from Kansas City and really all the other hundreds and hundreds of communities in the Missouri River Basin and the upper Mississippi River Basin. And if I live down here in New Orleans, I'm drinking uh, treated wastewater from the entire Mississippi River Basin. So the message that I'm trying to get here is that when I talk to you about should we be recycling our wastewater, we're already doing it. We've actually been drinking recycled wastewater. If you're drinking water out of a river and you're not the very first person on that river, you are drinking recycled wastewater from someone who is upstream from you. And so the contaminants that are not removed by a wastewater treatment plant um, do make it into our water supply. And it's something we need to worry about from our water treatment process. So um, we are drinking wastewater that has been introduced into the environment, but why would we want to recycle our wastewater directly? Is there any advantage to recycling it directly as opposed to uh, putting it in the environment and then letting someone downstream of us take it out for their water supply? And, and yes, there are some good reasons. And so the, in short, the reason is water scarcity. And so this is a map of the United States predicting which counties are going to be, uh, have water scarcity 30 years from now. And the darker red uh, is talking about more severe water scarcity. And this is not just municipal systems, but all types of water use. So the big center of the country here, Texas and the states north of that, the water scarcity we're really talking about there is really related to agriculture. And so what's happening is we've been overusing our water supply for decades and with changing conditions and that's um, continuing, you know, growing population, continuing to overuse that water supply, coupled with drought, coupled with climate change, we're gonna to get to the point where there's not enough water to provide the irrigated agriculture in those areas. And the same here in um, Eastern Arkansas, this is primarily an agricultural issue. But there's areas of the desert Southwest, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and um, Florida here, which are really driven more by population growth and urban areas not having enough water supply. And so if we're worried about not having enough water, then we need to start exploring alternative sources for water. And this is gonna be a regional thing where there's gonna be different solutions in different areas. So maybe in Florida, they could focus on desalinating seawater as an additional water supply. And maybe there's areas in the interior of the country here where there are deeper, moderately salty, what we call brackish water aquifers that could be used as an additional water supply. Um, but perhaps um, treating our wastewater is an additional way to extend our water supply. And let me give you a couple examples. So here in Albuquerque, our water rights portfolio, this, the Albuquerque Water Authority is allowed to take a certain amount of water out of the Rio Grande, and it's the same amount every day. And so their water rights permit says they get to take a certain amount every day. And the amount they're allowed to take out is actually more than they need in the winter and less than they need in the summer. And so what we have is a situation where some of their water rights are going unused in the winter because they actually, the, the city of Albuquerque does not use as much water as what their, their permit allows them to take. And so here's an example. If we could take um, excess water, uh, take wastewater and treat it to drinking water quality and inject it into the aquifer instead of putting it back in the river because this, this permit, you get credit for what you put back. And so instead of putting that back in the river, if they injected that into the aquifer, they could store water and then use it in the summer. And so reusing wastewater would be a way of, of 
storing water for future use. When you have excess water, you could store that water for future use. And here in California is another example of where portable reuse makes a lot of sense. So Cal Southern California in particular imports water hundreds of miles. So the population there is much greater than what the local water supply will, will maintain. So they, they import water from the Colorado River and from Northern California. The water gets used in the community then goes to the wastewater treatment plant, and then it's discharged in the Pacific Ocean. So, so basically they're importing water hundreds of miles, using it once, cleaning it up and putting it in the Pacific Ocean. Now, if they were able to use that, recycle that water, use it more than once, every gallon that they are able to recycle is a gallon that doesn't need to be imported hundreds of miles. So there's another example of where uh, uh, reusing our wastewater would make sense. So what we need to think about then is if we're closing the loop on our using our wastewater as a water supply, then we now need to think about what's the level of quality and what's the treatment that we need to make sure that that water is safe to drink. So going back to um, the urban water cycle that I showed a minute ago, this is what we would call de facto reuse. We're taking water out of the the river, using it in our community, going to a conventional wastewater plant and putting it back in the river for someone downstream to use. And so if, instead of doing that, what if we were to go through additional treatment, additional advanced treatment, and then store that water. So here I'm showing storing at a reservoir, but we could also store it in an aquifer. And then um, put that water back into the community. And so every gallon of water that comes from our storage system here is a gallon that we don't need to take out of the environment and we can extend our freshwater supply by recycling. Of course, putting in this reservoir here is gonna allow it to get dirty again because leaves and dirt is gonna blow into this reservoir. Birds are gonna land on this reservoir and so it has to go through the water treatment plant again. So perhaps it would be better to do an engineered storage buffer where the water is not put into a reservoir, into an aquifer, but stored in tanks. And if that's the, and this is what we would call direct potable reuse. And if that's the case, maybe it doesn't even need to go back to the water treatment plant. It can just go back to the community. The advanced treatment train that I'm talking about in that previous slide, that advanced treatment is, so this is a, a common process train, membrane filtration, followed by reverse osmosis, followed by advanced oxidation. And they call this full advanced treatment, but there's other options available. So in this particular treatment chain, the membrane filtration would really be focused on removing those pathogens. Uh, it's very, very uh, good quality treatment technology for that. The reverse osmosis would be focused on removing the chemicals and then the advanced oxidation would, the goal there would be any, any pathogens or any chemicals that made it through the first two, we could, we could clean them up there. So I'm going to talk about two treatment projects or two research projects that I've done here at UNM. The first one, um, looking at an alternative to the reverse osmosis process and whether ozone biofiltration would be another way of doing organics removal. And now I'm, I'm talking trace organics removal because I'm going to be dividing organics into what we call bulk organics. This is the um, the natural organic matter and kind of the, the collective um, organics that are in the water. And then trace organics would be specific individual chemicals that are at very low concentrations. So for instance, a particular pharmaceutical, a particular drug that might be in the water, uh, can we remove that to levels to make sure that that water is safe to drink? So this, this research project was funded by the New Mexico Environment Department and the student who worked on this is Odell Lee, and I think he's even on the line right now, so that's exciting. This is a, um, just what a full-scale ozone biofiltration system would look like. So ozone and biofiltration, it's a combination of chemical oxidation and biological degradation. So we have organic matter that can be degraded biologically, and then there's also organic matter that is not biodegradable. And the idea here is to take a, a strong chemical oxidant like ozone and break those organic molecules into smaller pieces where the smaller pieces are then biodegradable. So we start out with 
biodegradable and non-biodegradable organic matter. We uh, add ozone to, to break down, to chemically break down the non-biodegradable organic matter so that it can then be broken down biologically. And so this, uh, this picture here is a full-scale ozone generator that we would see at a water treatment plant. And these are um, biofilter contactors. Now I'll say that ozone and biofiltration has been used fairly extensively in water treatment. So taking water out of the environment and making it safe to drink um, in, in our communities. There was very little research done on how effective this technology might be in a wastewater application. So will, we know it works if I'm taking water out of a river. Will it work if I'm treating uh, a, a treated wastewater? And so the idea here is that reverse osmosis, that middle process that I that I showed in that process train is, is what we call the, the gold standard for removing chemical contaminants. But it's got some, some problems. It's expensive, it's very energy intensive, and it produces a large waste stream. And so what Odell was looking at here, what he and I were looking at is maybe there's an alternative that would be less expensive, less energy intensive, and um, produces less of a waste stream. And so our research questions here were how does ozone biofiltration compare to the reverse osmosis process for trace organic removal? How much ozone might we need and how much of the non-biodegradable organics will it actually degrade? And then are there other parameters that we could use to monitor this process? So um, as some examples, and I'm gonna be getting a little bit more into organic chemistry as we go on through this presentation. So I'm showing two chemicals here, sulfamethoxazole, which is um, an antibiotic. And um, um, I, I um, iopromide, um, which is a contrast agent, which is used for like CT scans and stuff like that. So the, Conventional wastewater treatment is not effective at breaking down these kinds of organic chemicals. And I'm showing the chemical structure here. And I know if you haven't had organic chemistry, well, probably everyone's had organic chemistry, but no, really, if you haven't had organic chemistry, then maybe these images don't mean anything to you, but I'm gonna talk about them a little bit more over the next 20 minutes and explain uh, some of the things that I'm showing here. So we looked at these two chemicals as well as 80 other compounds. Uh, I'm gonna skip a lot of the details about the uh, um, variables we were looking at, but this is just a schematic of our process train. So we, we put this system out at Albuquerque's wastewater plant and we took water out of their primary clarifiers. They had a pump station there and, and they allowed us to set up a, our pilot system in their, in their pump station. We built some small scale membrane bioreactors and then fed that through an ozone contactor. We added ozone here. So we have an ozone contactor. Um, and then that water went through a biofilter and we stored it. And there's a couple places along here where you can see we're taking samples. So these, these S's are our pharmaceutical and personal care product sampling points. And so we were looking for pharmaceuticals and and, um, and personal care products, which would be things like uh, mosquito repellent is what we consider a, a personal care product that we don't necessarily want to drink. And so we had this ozone biofiltration system. We also had a small scale reverse osmosis system and we operated those two in parallel. Um, small scale system. So these two tanks here were our membrane bioreactors. We have a bunch of instrumentation where we were controlling the pumps and and monitoring pressures and flows and things like that. The reverse osmosis system isn't in this picture, but it was sitting up here on this table. Okay, so just uh, jumping into some quick graphs. So I mentioned we have non-biodegradable dissolved organic carbon, carbon and, or, and biodegradable dissolved organic carbon. And so here, this particular result, we were explore, exploring how ozone dose affects the portion of the bulk organic carbon that's not biodegradable. And what we saw is that as, as in consistent with our hypothesis that the ozone would break down some of those organic molecules and, and 
reduce the non-biodegradable fraction and then actually increase the biodegradable fraction of this organic matter. Um, what we did find though is that it only removed it by about half. So we only were able to degrade about half of the non-biodegradable organic matter. And once we got above an ozone dose of about eight milligrams per liter, it didn't matter how much more we added, it, it didn't improve beyond that. Uh, we also looked at a parameter. Now this, this parameter, this non-biodegradable dissolved organic carbon is actually a hard thing to measure. The, the tests take about a week to do. And so we also um, had some, a very simple test, UV absorbance. And what we found is we had the same trend of removal and so here was a, a surrogate parameter that we could use that we could relate to the organic matter. And uh, you could see a, by the time we got to about eight milligrams per liter, no more removal of the UV absorbance. So this was a, a very simple, easy parameter. You can actually measure this continuously online. And so this would be a parameter that you could use to control the process if you were gonna do ozone biofiltration rather than going out and measuring this non-biodegradable dissolved organic carbon, which is very hard to do, you can measure a UV absorbance um, to monitor the process. Now I'm skipping a lot of details, but getting into the, the removal of the trace organics, we looked at about 80 compounds, and we ended up looking at three different ozone doses. So two milligrams per liter, four milligrams per liter, and eight milligrams per liter of ozone, followed by the biofilter. And what you can see is, um, these different colors here, the, the darkest blue means that we removed the organic compound uh, below the detection limit. So we removed it to where we couldn't, we couldn't detect it anymore. And then the next color, the red means we removed it 90% of it, then 70% of it, more than 50%, and then less than 50%. And so what you see is a two milligram per liter dose was really not very good. We were not able to remove very many of the compounds. The four milligram per liter dose did better and the eight milligram per liter dose did even better. And remember that was about the point where higher doses wouldn't have made any difference. And then comparing that to reverse osmosis. And, and so on the X axis here, I've got the number of compounds. So we had about 80 different organic compounds we were looking at. What we found is that Reverse osmosis would remove about 90% of them to below the detection limit, and the rest were removed more than 90%. The ozone biofiltration did almost as good on removing things below the detection limit, but then the last few compounds here were not removed quite as well. So even though, so we explored this again because reverse osmosis is an expensive, energy-intensive process. And we found some promising results, but it's maybe not quite as good as reverse osmosis. It's not quite as good as that gold standard. And so maybe what we learned here is that ozone biofiltration would need to be coupled with another process, perhaps uh, granular activated carbon to, to clean up these last few compounds if we wanted it to perform as good as reverse osmosis for organic removal. So now let me move on to our, our second uh, project, my second research project that I'm going to talk about. And again, I'm focused on trace organic removal, this time by reverse osmosis. So we're going, I'm going back to that, that gold standard process and exploring how well it works and what are the situations where it doesn't do what we wanted to do. This research was funded by the Water Use Foundation and Lauren Breitner was the, the graduate student doing this work. So the issue here is that even though reverse osmosis, we do kind of consider that the gold standard for removing chemical contaminants, there are some things it doesn't remove, it remo you know, that are poorly removed, and it's not really clear why. So there's some general trends that people in the profession understand about reverse osmosis. So things like mo molecular weight, the bigger the chemical, the better it should be removed by reverse osmosis. And we also look at um, uh, hydrophobicity. So if something um, is, likes to be in water, then maybe it's uh, easier to pass through the membrane than something that doesn't like to be in the water. Um, but there are all kinds of chemicals that just don't follow these trends that we expect to see. And it's not, not been clear why they don't follow these trends. So sometimes there's a 
fairly big chemical that, that gets poorly removed by reverse osmosis. So we had a hypothesis that maybe the functional chemistry of a molecule affects its removal. So we were exploring that question. How does functional chemistry affect removal? We also wanted to explore different membrane products. So reverse osmosis is a commercially available technology. There's a bunch of different companies that make reverse osmosis membranes um, for different purposes. And do they all work the same or are there some that are better than others? And again, we wanted to find if there was a surrogate compound that would help us understand how to compare these different membrane products uh, for how well they remove organics. So I showed a picture of a reverse osmosis system before. It was these big long tubes. This is what the reverse osmosis membrane module actually looks like. It's a, it's a module, it's about eight inches in diameter and about 40 inches long and inside this uh, element right here is rolled up membrane and the membrane is a, a polymeric material it's about as thick as paper and there's there's actually hundreds of square feet of membrane material rolled up in this tube and the idea is we put uh, the contaminated water in uh, through the end of this tube under high pressure the water has to flow through that membrane and the water molecules go through and Ideally, the contaminants don't, and so we now have a stream of clean water coming out and a, a stream of contaminated water coming out. So I know I've got engineers in the audience, so I needed to at least show some equations to make them happy. And so uh, I just want to explain a little bit more about how reverse osmosis works. And so in a previous slide, I had blue dots that showed water molecules, and I've got that again here. And now I've got some red dots that I'm showing as, as solutes. So these are um, ions or molecules that are dissolved in the water. And you can see they're the same size as the water molecule. So I'm not gonna be able to remove them just by filtering them by size or something like that. So what's happening in a reverse osmosis membrane is I've got a dense material where the, the water is actually just gonna permeate through this picture. Uh, um, you know, a, a porous ceramic pot for where the water just kind of weeps through the, the material. That's, that's what's happening here. And there's two things that are controlling the separation of the contaminants from the water. Uh, there's the partitioning. And so this is how much of the uh, species goes in. So if the water had a high partitioning coefficient, we would have a lot of water molecules in this material. If I had a low partition coefficient, so for instance, if the contaminant had a low partition coefficient, I would have a low number of contaminant molecules. So there's one question is how many can get into the material? And then the second question is how fast they move across. And how fast they move across is the kinetics, which is controlled by diffusion. And so what I want is a situation where water has a high partition coefficient and a high rate of diffusion. So that means lots of water molecules are entering the material and moving across quickly. The contaminants, not very many of them enter and they diffuse across slowly. And so what we see on the, the downstream or the permeant side of the membrane is, is now clean water because there's much more water coming through that membrane than, um, than other. And then, so the engineers in the audience can, can uh, you know, focus on the equations and, and see what's going on there too. Okay, so the question that we want to ask is how does the functional chemistry of a particular contaminant affect how much it can get into the membrane material and then how fast it can go across? And so here we have an experimental system. Um, Lauren had to build this system. We have a feed tank down here and a feed pump. Uh, I had this from previous projects, but it hadn't been used for a couple of years, so we had to tear down the pump head and rebuild it. And that's always lots of fun. Behind this blue panel here, we have our membrane system and we had five different membranes in here at a time. Ultimately, we looked at eight different membrane products and 73 different organics, uh, three different test pressures and some other variables that I'm not gonna get into. From the organics, we took a different approach here. So since we were trying to explore functional chemistry, I wanted to, Essentially, what we're trying to do here is look at things atom by atom, what's happening. 
And so we had compounds, after we had done the test, we had compounds that were not removed at all. So essentially had 0% removal to some things that had greater than 99% removal. So we had this wide range of removal that we were able to relate to the functional chemistry. So what we were doing, and now I'm gonna get into this functional chemistry uh, nomenclature again. So these, these lines represent uh, bonds between carbon atoms. And so this particular uh, molecule, acetone, would have a, a carbon here, a carbon here, and a carbon here. So it's a three carbon chain and it's got a double bonded oxygen on it. And so these 73 organics we were looking at here, we looked at in a very systematic way. So how does removal change or how does rejection of that compound, by rejection I mean it doesn't go through the membrane, how does that change when I add one more carbon atom and then add another carbon atom and another carbon atom? And so very systematically looking at small changes to molecules and how that will affect rejection. Or for instance, here I've got isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol looks just like acetone except it's got a hydroxide, hydroxyl group instead of the double bonded oxygen. So acetone is what you've got in your fingernail polish. Isopropyl alcohol, you might have that in your cabinet at home for disinfecting surfaces and stuff like that. Here I've got uh, methyl isobutyl ketone. M methyl isobutyl ketone looks exactly like a two hexanone, except this is a chain of six carbons. This also has six carbons, but instead of the last carbon being on the end, we've moved it up one position. So it's got a little bit different in terms of its structure, but actually the, the same molecular formula. Uh, then we had things like chloroethane and chloroethene. So the, again, these two molecules look virtually identical, except this one's got a double bond carbon where this one has a single bond carbon. And here we have uh, benzene. Benzene is in gasoline. It's in your fuel. So it's toluene. Um, so here I've got a benzene molecule. What happens when I add just a single methyl group onto a benzene? How is that going to change how it goes through RO membrane? Or instead of a methyl group, I'm going to add a chlorine group for chlorine benzene. Or what happens when I add two chlorine groups? And so we, we made these very um, specific stepwise changes in the molecules. And then I ran it through our experimental system to see how rejection changed. And now I've got a bunch of slides that show those results. So here I've got three chemicals where the only difference between these is the carbon chain is longer. So this is dichloroethylene, uh, dichloropropene, and dichlorobutene. So two carbons, three carbons, four carbons. And as we add more carbons, the removal of this compound or the rejection of it through the membrane went up. And this is exactly what we would expect. So here, this, is, this top number is the molecular weight. As the compound got bigger, it was rejected by the membrane better. And so this follows the trends that everyone um, in the profession would expect to see. So this is, this, is not, um, this is not unusual. Here, we've done the same thing. So I'm starting with a benzene and then add one methyl group and then two methyl groups and then three methyl groups. So again, I'm just making the molecule bigger by going from benzene to toluene to xylene to trimethylbenzene. And you can see the molecular weight gets bigger and the rejection or the removal goes up. And again, this is what we would expect that the bigger it is, the harder it is to get into the membrane material and the slower it's gonna diffuse across. And so we're gonna have better rejection. So this follows the trends that, that people expect. Now let's look at some other things that are a little bit more unusual. So here I've got chlorobenzene and toluene. So these two molecules are identical, except this has a methyl group where this one has a chlorine group. The, the chlorinated compound is actually higher molecular weight because chlorine has a higher molecular weight than a, than a carbon. And so if you were to give these two compounds to a, a reverse osmosis engineer, he'd say, oh, the Chlorobenzene should be rejected better because it's got a higher molecular weight. And actually we see lower rejection here. So this starts to explain some of the um, um, 
things that don't follow the trends that we've been confused about in this field. And so these two are the same thing. Here I've got two chlorines and two methyls and the same thing. The one with the chlorines has lower rejection than the one with the um, two methyls. So what we're finding is that by virtue of having a chlorine on this, the chlorine is either allowing it to get into the membrane at a higher concentration or to diffuse faster or both uh, as a virtue of the, um, the chemistry there, even though it's, um, you know, technically it's a, a bigger molecule. The, um, the lower numbers on here have to do with the um, hydrophobicity of molecules. And um, I'm gonna avoid getting into that uh, with this audience. So here's, here's branching. So look at the molecular weight of these two. They both have a molecular weight of 100. So this is two, um, from a chemical formula point of view, this is two identical molecules. And so the conventional wisdom was, well, these should be rejected the same amount. What we see is the branched compound, so the one that has the carbon uh, not on the end. So instead of a, a straight chain of six carbons, I take the last carbon off and I stick it on a branch here. That actually gets higher rejection. And we saw that, um, that trend over and over again, that if we had a branched compound, it would get higher rejection than if we had a linear compound. Uh, um, structural isomers. So look at these three compounds here. So these are three different formulas of dichlorobenzene. I've got one for dichlorobenzene, which means uh, the two chlorines are opposite each other. One three dichlorobenzene, which means they're on um, um, two, two carbons that are separated by one carbon. And then one two dichlorobenzene, which means it's on two adjacent carbons. Again, the same molecular weight for all three compounds. So these have the same chemical formula, but different rejection and dramatically different rejection. So here we've got about 50% rejection for the 1,4-dichlorobenzene and up around 80% rejection for the 1,2-dichlorobenzene. Uh, Oops. And same thing. So here I've got uh, four chlorotoluene, so a chlorine and a methyl group uh, across from each other and a chlorine and a methyl group adjacent to each other. And when the, uh, when the substituents are adjacent to each other, we get higher rejection. So now we're starting to discover some structural aspects of molecules that affect how well they're removed by reverse osmosis. Uh, this was a big trend. So here's the acetone and the isopropyl alcohol. So again, two molecules that look almost identical, except this has an OH and this just has a double bonded oxygen. Very similar molecular weights, dramatically different rejection or removal. So you can see a double bonded oxygen is going to give you lower rejection than if you have a hydroxyl group. And then let's look at some carbon-carbon double bonds. So I've got a number of compounds here. I'll take them in sets of two. So here's uh, dichloropropene and dichloropropane. So this is an alkene. This is an alkene. The only difference is a, a single double bond. Again, very similar molecular weights. And a very big difference in rejection. So this double bond here is helping this compound get into the membrane and diffuse across faster. We see that again with trichloroethylene and trichloroethane and with tetrachloroethene and tetrachloroethane that adding the double bond made much lower rejection. So, so double bonded compounds are going to go through reverse osmosis much faster, much better than a single bonded compound. So just to summarize, um, some of the factors that are increasing our rejection is increasing carbon length, increasing number of substituents, branching, if the substituents are close together, if we have methyl or hydroxyl groups, and things that are going to make it worse is things like halogens and carbonyl groups, double bonded uh, carbons and aromatics. And so going back to these two compounds that I looked at when I was looking at the, the ozone biofiltration, I can now look at this compound and say, oh, this has some double bonded oxygen here. This is gonna be harder 
to remove with reverse osmosis. And here's an aromatic ring. And so our, what our goal is, is to be able to look at this structure um, beyond just the size of the compound, beyond its molecular weight, beyond its hydrophobicity, and understand what are the individual atoms and their structural char characteristics that are gonna help them pass through an RO membrane. So here I've got some of those double bonded oxygens. I've got a whole bunch of, of hydroxyl groups. Those are gonna help it have better rejection. These are gonna have it have worse rejection. So the goal would be to have what's called a group contribution model, which would be able to take these individual components and um, be able to essentially uh, assemble a, a, a mass transfer coefficient that would tell us how well any individual molecule will go through an RO membrane. So the goal here is if next year or the year after there's a new contaminant we need to worry about, there's a new pharmaceutical on the market that's getting into our wastewater supply, we would be able to predict whether that would be removed or not. And not just whether it'd be removed, but how it might be removed by different membrane products. And so another part of this same study was looking at membrane products. And so in California, there's a, a lot of movement toward potable reuse of wastewater right now. And because there's so many membrane reverse osmosis membrane products on the market, they have criteria. And they say, you need to use a membrane that has a sodium chloride rejection of at least 99.2% in order to use it in a potable reuse system. And the question that we wanted to ask is, do membranes that achieve that particular criteria, do they all have similar rejection of organics? And so we looked at eight different membrane products and six of them, six of them actually meet that 99.2% sodium chloride rejection. And I've got products here that are designed for desalinating seawater, I've got products that are designed for desalinating brackish water, and then I've got products that are, that are what are known as ultra low pressure or nanofiltration membranes. And so different products from different manufacturers, theoretically, if I was doing a potable reuse system in California, I could use any one of these six products and I would meet the specification. But what we found is those six products can actually have dramatically different removal of organics. So let me look at acetone here. So with the, the, uh, the GEAG membrane, it only got 30% removal of acetone, while the SW30 was getting 80% removal of acetone. So different products that meet, you know, meet the specification that uh, California wants for a potable reuse system can actually have very different performance. One thing that you'll notice, and, and so I've got a couple, several different compounds here, and this is significant because these are all different classes of compounds. So bromochloromethane is an alkane, acetone is a ketone, boron is actually an inorganic compound, tetrachloroethylene is an alkene, benzene is an aromatic, and isopropyl ether is an ether. So I've got different classes of compounds, and they all behave the same way. So even though this has lower rejection, the bromochloromethane has lower rejection than the isopropyl ether. The trend is the same in that the AG membrane had the worst rejection and the SW30 membrane had the best rejection. Same here, same here. So what we find is different classes of organic compounds all behave the same way as they pass through RO membranes and different RO membrane products. And so what we were able to do with this information is actually pick one of these and we were able to, to demonstrate uh, using boron as a surrogate. So if we knew um, a particular membrane's rejection of boron compared to another product, we would now also know that that membrane was better than the other product for all these other organics as well. And so one of the recommendations we made at the end of this study is that manufacturers needed to start putting boron rejection on their specification sheets to help engineers select the membrane products that they want to use for potable reuse systems. So our conclusions from this study was that um, functional chemistry is very important. And I went through all of those things that make better and worse rejection and that boron, boron is a suitable surrogate.
So just some concluding remarks. Um, the safety of our water supply depends on treatment for both pathogens and chemicals. Recycling of wastewater, what we call pulver use, can increase the resiliency of our water supply, depending on some local factors and, and where you might want to use it. There's lots of treatment processes that are available, and we need to understand how each one works from a scientific perspective, particularly as we close the loop between water, our wastewater and water supply, and particularly as new chemicals come on the market and we need to worry about whether those new chemicals are gonna be removed with the systems that we have. So I wanna finish with some acknowledgements. Um, this is all the various funding agencies that have funded my research while at UNM. Um, some federal agencies like NSF and the Department of Energy, um, research foundations like the Water Research Foundation and Water Reuse Foundation, consulting firms, um, national laboratories. I've got a couple of projects here, actually the, the DOE project and the, um, these two projects over here that were funded by nuclear operating companies had to do with entirely different treatment processes. This had to do with uh, waste streams from coal-fired power plants in the DOE case and waste stream or, or cooling water in the primary loop of a nuclear power plant and, and treatment issues associated with that in these cases. I've also um, listed a couple of places here, AVOG in Switzerland, RMIT in Australia, uh, UBC in Trussell. These are places that I've been on sabbatical that have helped support my uh, research in those locations as well. So in addition to funding agencies, um, the way uh, research works at universities is the faculty member, me, usually sits in their office with their feet up on their desk and um, the students do all the work, right? And so um, this is some of the students who have worked with me over the years. Um, not all of them. This is the ones I could find their, uh, their pictures on LinkedIn or something like that. But um, I do want to acknowledge uh, more than anything the students who actually do this research. Every student that I work with, I tell them their job is to become an expert and then teach me something. And so I've grown as a person because all of the people on this slide have been able to, to teach me new things about uh, water, water treatment, water chemistry, and, and water engineering. And beyond our students, we've got colleagues that are important. So the colleagues I work with at UNM, um, I've learned so much from them. The colleagues that I worked with when I was in consulting, uh, particularly, um, I want to acknowledge these people, Rhodes, George, Dave, and John. These are my co-authors on the two textbooks that I worked on. Uh, these four guys are, each one of them is way smarter than I am. And I've learned so much by being able to be a co-author with them on these two textbooks. It's, it's really, um, been an important part of my career and en enriched my life to be able to, to learn from, from these truly worldwide experts. And, and on a more personal level, and Julie mentioned this a little bit at the beginning, Jim, Holly, and Catherine have certainly been a support to me over these years. And, and Julie mentioned that my wife, Elaine, is also a water treatment engineer. And so our kids had to put up with uh, hundreds and hundreds of dinnertime conversations about water treatment technologies um, and learn to live with that. And um, my wife Elaine's been my partner on Later of Everything. She even let me use her office uh, for this presentation so I didn't have to make this presentation in a, in a bedroom, which is where I'm usually working. And, and finally, who really makes us who we are are our parents. And so I want to acknowledge um, my mom and dad. Um, Bruce and Jenny Howe um, really made me who I am today. And uh, everyone say a quick prayer for my mom who happens to be in the hospital right now. And with that, I'm done. Uh, thank you very much. And I think we can open this up to questions. Sorry, we ran a little bit late and I'm gonna blame it on the uh, mishap with the, uh, uh, the sound early on. Yes, Carrie, that's fine. Thank you. Everybody join me in applause for Carrie, please, whether it's uh, in your participant box or unmuting. We've got about five minutes for questions and uh, Tabitha's going to help me see the hands that get raised in the participant box. So 
Um, are there any questions for Carrie? Oh, Christos. All right, Carrie, <clears throat> very nice. I'm uh, very proud of you, your family, and your parents. Good job. Thank you. you deserve a lot of credit. So, I wanted to ask you do you see one day, because of the scarcity of water, that we're going to have recycling units? in a house like it will be part of the building of new homes in the future i, I think that's certainly a possibility and and there's there's a lot of logic to doing stuff at a more distributed scale like that so one of the things we do right now is we treat water at a centralized facility we treat it to the highest possible quality we need which is drinking water and then we send it to your house and you use a bunch of that water to flush your toilet, right? That doesn't make any sense. And so, um, you know, if you think about doing um, localized or distributed treatment where maybe you would get high quality water that you could use at your kitchen sink for drinking, do just a very minor amount of treatment and then use the wastewater from your kitchen sink to flush your toilet, um, that would be a much more efficient use of water, a much more efficient use of treatment technologies and energy if we're able to um, move things down to a, to a smaller scale like that. Cool, thanks. Okay, do we have any more questions? I do, Tabitha. Okay. Kerry, uh, very nice talk, thank you, congratulations. Uh, Thank you. I know, I know you and I have had this email exchange, but uh, can you take a minute or two and talk about the uh, COVID-19 uh, testing through uh, water sewage and its impact and how, wh how is that impacting your work? Sure, that's a great question, Edo. Um, so I mentioned one of the big goals of water treatment there is, is pathogen removal. And I had one slide that had viruses on it. And so uh, as uh, humans use the toilet, they, they do shed virus. And so people who are sick with COVID will shed virus and it ends up in the wastewater system. And there are, um, there, there is the ability to go um, uh, analyze sewage and find coronavirus in it. And so, this is being done for uh, epidemiological reasons and for and if it could be done on large scale, it would actually um, help us control outbreaks. And so, for instance, there's a university in Arizona, uh, I don't remember if it's ASU or University of Arizona, um, that is um, analyzing the wastewater from every dorm. And so they don't have to analyze individual people um, but if they detect coronavirus in the wastewater then they know someone in that dorm is sick and so then after they've had a positive detection in the wastewater they can go in and do targeted um, targeted um, testing of people and isolate cases quicker and and essentially keep an outbreak from happening by being proactive at um, um, detecting coronavirus. So there's, there's actually quite a few cities around the, the country that are in the process of analyzing their wastewater for coronavirus right now, as well as universities that are doing it. Um, I don't think our, um, our, our national coronavirus response is, is organized well enough to use this data effectively to control outbreaks. Um, but we are getting a lot of good epidemiological information on on how it's spreading through communities. Um, so this uh, can by, be by doing this for future for the future. This can be a real important uh, arsenal in the war chest for uh, the CDC. That that's right. So we can we can learn more about how rapidly something spreads through a community, how it spreads from one part of town to another part of town and those sorts of things by doing this kind of epidemiological research. Um, I'm not a 
biological guy myself, so this doesn't have a big impact on my research. Uh, Andy Schuler is uh, really more the expert on the wastewater side of things and, and would be the right person to ask uh, for how these analyses are done and things like that. They, they do use the same kind of uh, PCR testing that they, they use for the, the highest quality coronavirus uh, tests that are done. Harry, we're going to take two more questions, um, first by uh, Provost Holloway and then by Jose. So, okay. Provost Holloway. So, I'm actually going to play the pro Provost card and, and ask two questions. Uh -oh. Harry, one, can you show us your, your award? I can. I think uh, Gabrielle was going to ask for this later. Ah, okay. Here well, is. I got here ahead of him. Yeah, well, you have so that you right. Were, so the award inspires my second question, okay. um, which is shape, right? And so you're, you're, you know, you've analyzed a, a whole set of, of molecules going through um, reverse osmosis membranes, and clearly molecular weights, not, 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 it, it's a driver, of course, but it's not the only driver or a key That's driver. Right. Mm -hmm. is, is shape a really important issue, or is it about specific chemical bonding of you know, chlorine to the filter material, or is it really about shape? So, so shape is part of it. So one of the things that we looked at, um, in a, so we looked at a bunch of different parameters and we, we looked at um, length to width ratios uh, using molecular modeling. And for some groups of compounds that really mattered. So for instance, the structural isomers, if I'm looking at uh, the three different dichlorobenzenes, um, the shape seemed to be the biggest factor that controlled the fact that 1,4-dichlorobenzene went through better than 1,2-dichlorobenzene, for instance. Um, in other cases, it wasn't shape, or it's not shape. It seems to do more with um, um, internal polarity. Um, so the fact that um, a chlorine atom is more electronegative, um, uh, seems to have a more important factor, and I think it has to do with that partitioning into the membrane as opposed to, um, uh, you know, the shape part of it. Um, so, so I think what we're finding is, that, you know, the functional chemistry is driving several other parameters, but it's not a single thing. It's not just shape, but it seems to be both shape, um, electronegativity, um, and there was actually one other thing that, uh, um, we, we saw as an important factor that's slipping my mind right now because uh, I must be hungry or something. <laughs> so we're going to well, let Jose Serrato ask the final question before we turn it back over to the Vice President for Research. So Jose. Yeah, so uh, Kerry, I first want to thank you for being such an amazing, inspirational colleague. Uh, you know, you're the thank best. You. <laughs> and uh, I can I cannot ask for a better director for the Center for Water. Uh, this success is definitely not lucky, right? I mean, there's a lot of uh, amazing uh, glue that you bring together people. And my question has to do with that ability that you have of bringing people together. So what do you think is our mission as the trainers of water professionals in the world, where, where should we going? If you had to give us a tip, uh, you know, up to your legacy, what, where, where do you want us to go? From a training and research perspective, uh, you know, to, to, to change the world. Well, so um, I'll refer to one of those people that I um, co-authored a book, um, Rhodes Trussell. Um, so, I've had some long conversations with him. And, and if we look back, if we go back to the, my history slides when we started at um, 1854 with John Snow, all the way up to about the 1970s, our view of water treatment was very phenomenological. Uh, we would uh, say, oh, this process seems to work removing this contaminant. And we would just, you know, try, it was all, it was all trial and error. It was all, um, just seeing what worked. And starting in about the 1970s, we integrated science into the engineering. And so the kind of thing that I was presenting today of, well, let's look at the functional chemistry to understand how this RO membrane works instead of just going and saying, let's see if it removes this compound. Let's see if it removes this compound. Let's see if it removes this other compound. 
but look at the science and engineering together. And this is something that I think Rhodes really taught me. And one, one of the things where I think he's really an expert and that's um, using scientific principles to explain how water treatment technologies work and then using those scientific principles into the design. And I think that's what we should be focusing on teaching the next generation is that there are reasons, scientific reasons, why these treatment technologies do what we do. And as long as we can get to a better point of understanding why scientifically why they do what we do, why they do what they do, we will be better off. We will be better design engineers if we understand the underlying fundamental science behind these processes. So we gotta, we gotta keep the science and engineering together. Okay, thank you, Dr. Howe. Um, um, if anybody has any additional questions, um, we're running kind of low on time. I will provide my email in the chat and um, I will make sure that Carrie gets um, those uh, questions. Now I will turn it over to the Vice President for Research, um, Gabriel Lopez. <laughs> so there you go, James. Um, my name is Gabriel Lopez. It's my pleasure uh, to um, be Vice President for Research and um, to oversee the office that sponsors this event. Uh, thank you very much, distinguished Professor Howe, for a very captivating lecture. Uh, water research, especially here in the desert Southwest, is absolutely critical to our future and really to the future of the nation as a whole, especially as the climate changes and our population in continues to increase. Access to clean water is a complex issue, but as we've heard tonight, innovative solutions and innovative engineers will help us face the unique challenges that are sure to come our way and are already coming our way. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the lecture tonight. Uh, it was very accessible. I think for me, probably the, the, the uh, part I enjoyed the most was really the, the last message that uh, Professor Howe had uh, in response to Professor uh, Serrato's question and his, um, his um, statement that um, it is really important that the um, science informs the engineering. It's a great, great engineering talk, but it was also uh, had a good amount of chemistry in it, and I think that it, it's a very good message that uh, um, in order to to uh, move forward in, in these technologies, we really have to understand the underlying chemistry as well as the engineering. Um, and you know, as as we move forward, um, it's it's likely that advanced uh, uh, data manipulation and, and analysis techniques. Uh, will help us do this. So um, with that, um, I'd like to uh, offer special thanks to the UNM Faculty Senate's Research Policy Committee who uh, kindly provided their time uh, and, and uh, effort to select tonight's uh, lecture, Carrie Howe. I'd also like to recognize the OVPR staff for their hard work in putting together this nice event. Um, and in lieu of a formal award presentation, I would like to now invite uh, Professor Howe to hold up his award once again in recognition of his extraordinary work and contributions to UNM. Kerry, would you please uh, uh, hold up your award and say something so that we make sure that everybody can see you. Okay. So this is what arrived at my house today, just like the picture that you're seeing. It's a, a very unique and beautiful green image. Kitchen. Yeah. Um, thank you, Carrie. Um, Gabrielle, I think you need to stop sharing your screen image so that we can see Carrie. Correct. I thought it could have worked, but I will stop sharing.
There okay. you go. Okay, so to say it again, here's, here's the award. Thank you, everyone. I, um, I really, really am honored to receive this award from UNM. And thank you, um, Carrie. Um, I would like to personally thank you for your effort in advancing research at, at UNM. And I also like to uh, offer uh, my best wishes uh, for the speedy recovery of your mother. Thank you. Um, thank you all for attending tonight's lecture and joining us in honoring uh, Professor Howe. At this point, uh, before we all sign off, I'd like to invite everybody to unmute and really give Carrie a round of applause. So please, Unmute. Yay. <laughs> Don't be shy. Show us you're still there. Thank you all. Um, have a good evening and have a safe Halloween weekend. Good night. Thank you, Gabrielle. Goodbye, Thanks. everyone. Thanks very much. Good job, Carrie. Yeah, great job. Thank you. Congratulations, Carrie. Go have a beer. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs>